joining us for tonight's program on the future of higher education with Dr. Eric Barron, Dr. Rick Levin, and moderated by Catherine, Dr. Catherine Reggio. I'm Claire Noble, the program manager for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our executive director, Dale Mosier, our board chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium board, welcome. We are now in our 49th year of providing our community with thought-provoking and affordable programming. Two items to be aware of before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see an option for Q&A. Please type your questions in there at any time for tonight's speakers, and we'll get to those, pro those questions later in the program, and we'll get to as many as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It's being recorded, and you'll be able to find that recording on our website, veilsymposium.org. I'd like to take a moment to thank the organizations and individuals who've helped make tonight's program possible. Our sponsors include the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Antlers at Vail, and the Vail Daily. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. The winter season is underwritten by Jeannie and Dale Mosier, underwriting the Hot Topic series, Kathy and Neil Kimmel. And tonight's underwriters are Rosemary Marr, Mendel Meltzer, and Doris Dutton. The Vail Symposium is also supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. If you're a Vail Symposium donor, thank you. If you're not, but would like to ensure that the Vail Symposium is able to continue offering quality programming, please visit veilsymposium.org to donate. I hope you'll make plans to join us on Thursday, January 14th at 6 p.m. for a program on understanding near-death experiences and the insights they provide with Dr. Scott Taylor. I also wanna give you a heads up about our other two programs in January because they're a little bit different. So we have a program coming up on January 21st, and it is a documentary, they say it can't be done, and Q&A with the filmmaker. But what we found with our last documentary is that Vimeo and Zoom don't play really well together and the quality suffered. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the Vimeo link available beginning on Monday. And that way you can watch the documentary in advance and then join us on the 21st at 6 p.m for a Q&A with the filmmaker. And then we have another program on January 28th, and this is the program on Russian efforts to undermine America. It turns out our speaker, Peter Pomeretsev, who just took a position with Johns Hopkins was previously posted to London with the London School of Economics. And it turns out right now, it's very difficult to get into the United States. They're not issuing visas. So he's still in London, which made a six o'clock program time um, unreasonable for him. So we've moved that program. It's going to be a morning program. And we're going to do that at 11 a.m. on January 28th. And if you're doing something at that time, but you're still very interested in the topic, we will be posting a video of that program on our website, veilsymposium.org. Tonight, we turn our attention to the future of higher education. In the interest of time, I will share condensed bios of our distinguished panel and the longer versions are available on our website. Dr. Rick Levin is an economist. He served as the CEO of Coursera recently. And prior to that, he was president of Yale University from 1993 to 2013. He holds an undergraduate degree in history from Stanford University, a bachelor of letters in politics from Oxford University and a PhD in economics from Yale. He holds honorary degrees from Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Oxford and Peking universities. And he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. Dr. Eric Barron began his tenure as the 18th president of the Pennsylvania State University in 2014. Previously, he served as president of Florida State University. He's chairman of the board of trustees for the University's Research Association, a member of the Knight Commission and the College Football Playoff Board of Managers an accomplished scientist with a long background in atmospheric research. Dr. Barron was the director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research and Dean of the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. He has a Bachelor of Science in Geology from Florida State University and a master's and a doctorate in oceanography from the University of Miami. Our moderator, Dr. Catherine Reggio is vice president of academic affairs at Colorado Mountain College. 
Prior to this role, she was vice president and campus dean of the Edwards campus. Dr. Reggio was the recipient of the Presidential Fellowship for Community College Excellence, the Aspen Institute, Washington, DC. She received her Doctor of Education, Higher Education Management from the University of Pennsylvania, her Master's of Business Administration from the University of Denver, and her Bachelor of Arts, International Business and German from Adrian College. She also attended Universität Heidelberg in Heidelberg, Germany. I'm going to turn things over to you, Dr. Reggio. And as a reminder to our audience, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions in there at any time, and we'll share those later in the program. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and special thanks to both Rick and Eric for your time this evening. And I'm really looking forward to a conversation. We, it's, it's, it's probably the least we could say that boy has a lot happened in the past year. Um, and there was a lot happening leading up to the last year. And so, you know, just to kind of bring the audience kind of up to all that has occurred in just the shortest of periods of time, you know, prior to the pandemic, there were a lot of things going on about what does higher education look like for the future to begin with. Um, you know, since 2016, more than 60 colleges have closed or merged. Um, we've seen enormous growth up, uh, in attendance to college up through 2010, uh, which was our largest year, and we've been declining in enrollment ever since, um, about 2 million students in the last decade. And that's largely driven by, you know, population as well. Um, and so in the mean, in, in that same space, while education and enrollment has been growing and growing, so has the cost of education. And now you see a retraction, you see closers, you see mergers, and you see this, this real big question mark about what's the right form of education? How do I take education online, in person? What's the value of education? How do I justify a cost? What about student loan debt? You know, all of these things weigh on everyone's mind, higher education's mind, the student's mind, parents' mind. And so all of this was going on before, uh, before March 2020, when I personally remember Friday, March 13th, uh, leaving my office and just kind of saying, I wonder, I wonder when I'm going to be back here. And, and just to see how much has changed and how much we've had to mobilize and operationalize. And uh, we're really looking forward to this conversation about what online learning looks at each of our institutions. And how has that changed and developed? And so that's where we are in terms of how do you take these experiences for students in learning that have been up until this point for most, for many students, highly interactive on ground, in a campus, brick and mortar, big buildings, amenities, all of these things. And, and where do we go from here? what matters most to students going forward, what matters most to those when it comes to the value of education. So that just lays a small platform of where we are today. And I just wanna open up the conversation to Rick and Eric, when you sit and kind of take a step back, you know, and you ask yourself your own question, gosh, where do we go from here? You know, what is the thing that sticks out most for you um, when the pandemic hit that was this, this ever, you know, perhaps ever changing, perhaps not forever changing moment that engaged either online with online education, moving things to online, keeping things in person. Just some reflections on what we've been through um, to, for the for the for the audience today. Um, and Rick, we'll start with you. Um, well, Catherine, thanks. I think you did a nice job summarizing the basic um, tendencies prior to the pandemic. That is, the you know the declining demographics, which have only been made up by uh, taking in international students. So if you think of from a system-wide point of view, um, are we going to be viable? Uh, um, there are gonna be schools that will have to close in, in the face of declining US demographics um, uh, with that, unless there's an expansion in international students, which politically doesn't seem all that likely at the current moment. So, so we, we have, there, there is an underlying pressure that will remain. Um, there's there's the problem of rising cost and, and 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 but offset in some part part by continuing studies every time we redo the study of what is the wage premium for people who spend 
uh, four years at an institution and a graduate with a bachelor's degree, the answer is 70% increase in lifetime income. And that's been true for 30 years now. And, and uh, it shows no sign of diminishing. So there's still a demand for well-educated people. And that is why the, for most people, the value proposition of borrowing to go to college actually makes sense. Um, but it's, but it's, but we worry, but you know, there's worries and the pressure of the large student debt load. I think everyone's familiar with that, familiar with that through the presidential campaign where it was a subject of wide discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, um, it was, it was, you know, the, the presence of online education as a potential, um, both potential opportunity and potential threat to, to the viability of our institutions um, was present um, before the pandemic. And I think it's all the more visible now. I'll have more to say about that later, given my experience with Coursera, but I think we should recognize it's not all brand new. There were worries about whether the pressure on smaller, less economically viable institutions would be exacerbated by the online alternatives that might arise and where students might take their education entirely online. Or indeed, something less noted that's become becoming more visible is alternative forms of institutions, alternative forms of education. You can get trained as an IT support specialist by Google in five months and it, it, at a much lower cost than it would uh, would be entailed at $49 a month, basically, um, uh, which is a much lower cost than two years to get an associate degree in the same field at a community college. So there's there's that pressure as well. So th those were all present pre-pandemic. They're still there. Eric, your thoughts on you know where we are today, and then we're going to move to the online conversation. But Eric, your thoughts on what you've experienced, Penn State. Sure. So I, I would say the, the first part is the changes were abrupt. And, and two thoughts. Uh, one is we have to keep our students safe. And two, we've got to get them to the finish line. Nothing could be worse than interrupting their education in a way that it costs them an extra semester or, or, uh, or they were three weeks from finishing their degrees and, and all of a sudden uh, you had to stop. So then, then we sort of watched how this evolved into what I would call almost an attitude that was driving the university. And one part of that is we're gonna meet you where you are, wherever you are, all over the world, anywhere over the world, on one of our campuses at, at, at University Park. Uh, and we have to be flexible. And so those two things sort of governed almost everything that Penn State did past the safety of the student. Be flexible, give them choices. They could go to this campus, they could go to our world campus, they could go uh, synchronously online, they could go asynchronously online, they could go face-to-face, -face, give, give them uh, choices while maintaining them safe. And we also saw back from our students a very clear message. The students wanted a university experience and they wanted flexibility to be able to make decisions on how it is that they got that uh, curriculum delivered. So I, I would say those were the things that were sort of driving Penn State in a lot of ways. Great. And, you know, from Colorado Mountain College's perspective, you know, we have, you know, 12 campuses, 11 campuses across 12,000 square miles. And what we really saw as we moved more into, just as you, you did, Eric, with these choices of synchronous, asynchronous, in-person for everything that needed to happen, it was really this, um, it became, you know, as we started asking students, what do you think? It's like, well, I, you know, some would say, I really like this. This is the best. I've never been able to com complete my degree in one campus. I've had to move around. I really like the flexibility online gives. We have other students saying, I just am struggling. I'm just struggling. I can't do this. I can't be on this computer like this. And, and so there was no one theme for sure in, in which way, which I think for me, one of the most enlightening things is, okay, well then how do we become more nimble where it is your education in a, your learning style? How do we become adaptive as higher ed leaders to really mold and shape our, our degrees in your ability to learn in a way that actually emphasizes your success in learning. And so to that, um, you know, we can move to, we all had to get into 
the online learning world more robustly. It's not that any of us had never been there before, but certainly more robustly than we've ever had. And so, you know, Rick, I'd love to hear your thoughts as, as you know, thinking about the Coursera, you know, MOOC model versus moving into where we are today with online learning and what you've seen and kind of being in the online learner, seen from online learning as a, success, a tool for success in um, retention and graduation rates for students. Let's speak a little bit about that. And then Eric, love to hear your experiences as well as you've had a huge on-ground infrastructure that went virtual. Rick? Yeah. Um... You know, the online world prior to the pandemic um, is pretty much dominated by those schools that were that were actively committed to it. And while many schools had some notional small scale presence online, um, you know, there were really actually only a limited number, maybe 50 worldwide, that were really deeply committed and were doing a lot, you know, a lot of their courses and perhaps a significant number of degrees uh, online. Um, the, the, the pandemic exposed the rest of the world to what those institutions had, or, had already been learning for the past seven or eight years. Um, and it, 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 in a way, many of the learning insights were replicated um, uh, and made us more confident. So one of the things that was replicated is what you mentioned, Catherine. Different learners respond to this differently. And, and the, the, the capacity to take, an, uh, like let's say an entirely asynchronous course, and really thrive in it without personal guidance, without personal help, whether it be online one-on-one -on -one, or online small group or, or, um, or, or in person. Um, many students need one of those things. Uh, um, you know, uh, students tend, generally speaking, the more highly educated and the more quantitative or straight, you know, sort of um, analytic the subject, the better people do online and the more discussion oriented and the less uh, independent, you know, well-prepared students uh, do, don't do as well, which has certain unfortunate social consequences, which is it's another way of saying it's easier for the elites to prosper in this environment than it is for students with various kinds of disadvantages in educational background or socioeconomic status. So, so you know, that's, a, that's definitely a problem we are going to have to confront as a society in the future. Um, uh, an, an, another thing um, we learned that that was a surprise to many, but but uh, wouldn't was no surprise to people at places like Coursera. By the way, if your audience doesn't know what Coursera is, maybe I should explain. Coursera is a is a is a uh, Silicon Valley company which has partnerships with about 150 universities around the world, mostly high level, top level universities, including Penn State. Um, uh, and Yale and Stanford and University of Michigan. Um, University of Colorado Boulder actually does a lot of, is very active on, on our platform. And, and those, school, those, those um, schools offer freestanding courses uh, that can be taken for free or for pay if you, if you get a certificate that are short, typically four weeks long. And they also offer more advanced credentials that are multiple courses, maybe a three month program um, and then finally, we offer about 20 master's degrees on our platform as well from schools like University of Colorado Boulder and University of Illinois um, uh, and University of Michigan. So uh, we, we've learned, we had learned, and now people began to see that actually, if we're talking about a small live session with 12 students, running a discussion online on Zoom is actually not much different from live sitting in a classroom. That tends to work very well. Um, when you're talking about a lecture course, having somebody be a talking head for 50 minutes straight on camera is even worse than having them be a talking head for 50 minutes straight in a classroom, which is actually pretty bad. Research has told us for years that the lecture format is a loser, but we, we persist in it. Um, so, you know, you have to break things up. You have to give people animations. You give them you gamify. You give them uh, videos. You break it up with quizzes, uh, all of that. We do all the Coursera courses are organized that way. And uh, very few universities were equipped to make that happen instantly when things went down in March. And so the people that taught lecture courses, as well as their students, tended to struggle in the, uh, in the adaptation to online learning. These are surmountable problems. We can, we can learn to master the technology 
and make that better. I could I could talk about a million other things, but when I stop there, I think I don't want to monopolize. Yep. So uh, Penn State had the advantage of having a an uh, the world campus, which has always been highly ranked for a couple of decades, uh, a large number of offerings uh, asynchronous. So um, we had the advantage of being able to quickly deploy an awful lot of the tools that, that we had, had to be able to move a, an, you know, uh, close to 100,000 students uh, into a remote in environment and literally uh, we made the decision over spring break and on Monday morning, we had 63,000 students in online classrooms by 10 a.m. in the morning on Monday. So I don't think we could have done that without having that, that foundation. But we were very conscious about the number of students that we would lose uh, because that wasn't the environment that they were gonna be successful in. So we had very high touch. We actually got more people to, to completion in that semester than we did in the previous two years for the end of spring semester, just because of the level of contact, because we were afraid who we were gonna lose because of technology, because of their access to technology, because of their, uh, their, their wealth and, and other factors. We also have been really conscious about how the World Campus addresses a group of individuals that are place-based, and this is really their only shot. And that's an incredibly important uh, thing to be able to deliver. But we also recognize that graduation rates aren't the same. And so we've been busily exploring things like, how do you make an online class transformative? Um, my alumni that give money tell me they, they had a transformative experience on the Penn State campus. Do you ever hear the student online say transformative? So how can, as an instructor, can you can you do that? How do you promote student engagement? And then the other thing we discovered, which Rick has described, is that we had far greater success and participation if it were if it were synchronous. And no matter where people were in the world, we met a class. So I met my class um, in, in that mode. I also uh, met met my class for uh, for the for the fall term in in face to face and, and hybrid mode. And that level of engagement can be quite successful. So we really leaned hard to, to do, do asynchronous on, only when it really had to be that way, promoting distance face-to-face -face and, and uh, synchronous classrooms um, for the rest of the time. And, and it proved to be quite successful. A lot of people still, uh, that isn't their mode. And, and that that's, uh, makes it difficult. But at least uh, through a lot of experimentation and really studying uh, how, how completion rates occurred, uh, we worked hard to get people to the finish line and make sure that they got that degree, which can transform uh, certainly their, their employment potential. You know, can I just jump in on that? Because it's one, I completely agree with what you said. Um, uh, about what worked and what didn't, and what the, you know, um, and and the and the advantage of synchronous. But you know, if you think about um, the potential for the future of online learning contributing to the solution of the economic problems of universities, if you think about pushing down the cost of higher education and expanding the market for higher education, what you need to, the the key ingredient in that is scaling the use of faculty so that faculty, so the faculty student ratio changes dramatically. We, you know, and, you, and a single faculty member teaches not 15 people or not 50, but 1500 people uh, or, or, or 5,000. And, and you know, that which is, which is the way which you can do asynchronously, but you can't do synchronously. So I think what we're gonna have to discover is what's the right, can, can we make asynchronous good enough to make it help to help us really move down that cost curve and and stem the rise rising cost of higher education while having enough high touch interaction that we can bring students along. So you've you've hit right on the nail, the nail around the head about a key paradox here. Yeah, I, you know, I think the theme that we're all you know hearing, and it's one of those, it's it's sort of, yeah, of course that's the answer, right? But connection matters. 
right? And what I think we've realized in our in in our own offerings of asynchronous and synchronous, you know, that those who are accustomed to the asynchronous world thrived. This in in some students who easily felt more comfortable or shyer students or you know less le you know less likely to speak up students just they had one of their best semesters ever and they said this um it was exciting to hear and then there were others who just felt like they were a stranger in a strange land you know lost they didn't know where to begin and what is interesting about you know when we think about online learning and, and online education i'd love to hear your thoughts on this is one of the biggest challenges is that we're used to like, okay, the asynchronous learner and the online learner looks like this and they want these things. And the in-person learner needs something else, but now they're in the same class together. Catherine, and, I'm sorry, could I just yes. butt in? Um, yes, for people in the audience who may not know exactly what you mean by synchronous versus asynchronous, could you provide a definition for that? Sure, sure. Uh, quite, uh, quite simply, uh, if, if it's if it's asynchronous, you're basically learning on your own, guided guided by the university. But but you you're you're doing this at your your own pace. You may, you may have different ways of interacting with the classroom, but basically you're picking the time. And synchronously, I'm actually meeting my class in the same way I would meet my class uh, face to face. They're just all on Zoom, uh, and so I have 30 pictures and and in front of me, but but we're having that same discussion with the class all at the same time. And and so then the students see each other, they feel like they're part of a group, uh, the discussion uh, changes. I would say a fascinating thing is I can have a deep discussion going on with the classroom and I will see that the chat button has 250 chat comments in there. They're actually multitasking, having side conversations about the topic of discussion. So it, it even has some features that it make it rich and interesting, but, but that's basically the difference, whether you're meeting the class all together at the same time or you're individual. Thanks. Um, so I, the curiosity question is, is where, where can online learning go and evolve when we've now been forced to experience, you know, students didn't get to choose. Right? They didn't get to choose their pathway and we know they want to choose, but we're also seeing our in-person learner, learners seeing benefits to online, our online learners seeing, man, I wish I had a little bit more connection. What does an online world look like in your mind that can blend those two? You know, if, if we're going to have this blended classroom of whether it's to help us maximize efficiencies in higher education, lower costs of education by doing things a little differently, we can't lose that connection because we do lose students along the way in one form or another. If we force too much connection, we lose the the, on, the wholly online learner. If we don't have enough, we lose the in-person learner. And so well, what thoughts do you have about how we build build that bridge between the two? So I'm, I'm gonna go back to what I said at the beginning, meet students where they are and provide them the flexibility and choices. And so I, I'm not necessarily looking for the bridge I'm looking for what's the best way that you can be educated, either based on your circumstances or based on your capabil capabilities. So I, I, I think what we discovered was we were on a path to meet students where they were, but we were having a rural campus and a residential uh, environment. We were having four-year degrees. I think we'll have packages and credentials and stacked credentials and people will come into Penn State and decide they want a chemistry major because it would a minor because it would advantage them in, in their employment. But if if the campus environment works great, if the online environment works great, if it's synchronous and you do well, great. If you really want that classroom experience, but you're still at a distance, great. I think I think as institutions we will evolve to a much level of much higher level of flexibility in this space as opposed to sitting there deciding that we have to somehow have the right mixture. I totally agree with that. And I, you know, I think you can offer students options even in the same course. I mean, years ago, we don't, various reasons we no longer do this. But when I taught at Yale in freshman economics, 
the students had an option of taking a small class. They could take, a, you know, a 20 person seminar style class or go to a large lecture. You know, we had a superstar famous professor doing the large lecture, but many people preferred, felt, you know, complicated subject, hard to master, hard to get the intuition. They wanted the hands-on, um, you know, activity of a, of a small class. So you, you can do, the equivalent is, you know, online is, you know, asynchronous versus synchronous. And, and uh, um, I think it, I think, I, I think Eric's exactly right. You can, you can, um, you can offer students options and meet them, try to meet their needs. That's what I, I, will, I will say, let me throw in a slightly different angle here, which is what we're talking about is all from the context of um, the university serving its existing enrolled students. But the, the, the real, to me, the thing that got me interested in online education um, and if, which I advanced at Yale for 13 years before I left and later went to Coursera um, is, the, is the capacity to reach far wider audiences and not just 18 to 22 year olds, but 18 to 85 year olds. Um, and, and if you look at Coursera's student body, if you will, only 11% of the students are under age 22. The, 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 the bulk of the students are between ages 22 and 45. And about two thirds of them are actually not taking liberal arts courses. They're taking business courses, technology courses, data science courses, courses that give them hard skills that will advance their careers. So what does that say? It says that universities have an option, have an opportunity now to educate far more people than they have educated in the past and by not restricting themselves to one slice of the, you know, of the age distribution. And and they can, they can actually achieve a much broader social mission, which is to advance people's economic opportunity throughout their careers. And so this dichotomy we always hear about, are we getting, should, you, should undergraduate education prepare you for a vocation or should it teach you critical thinking skills and the capacity to be flexible and adaptive so that you can learn anything later on? Almost automatically gets answered in, the fa in favor of the liberal arts approach because the skills part you can do later. You can do all through your career. And, 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 you can, and that's the part that can be done asynchronously much more effectively. So, I mean, if you think about what the mission of the university is going to be in 10 years or 50 years, I think it's gonna be serving the entire, the entire population and to be hubs of, you know, of, of, of knowledge and learning and using this, this very valuable resource, which is our highly skilled faculty, to, to, to just reach our wider audiences, which helps bring the cost, the, the overall cost of education. So I, I'd like to add up a, a Penn State twist to that, if, if I can, especially with the notion that someone already educated can do much better in, in, the, in the asynchronous uh, in, environment. They're much more successful because they, they, they know what it, what it takes. But so this is this is the same expansion, but one that's focused on 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 Penn State. So um, imagine a portal you go in, it does everything for you from the from any of the finances, registration or, or anything else. And and then you tell your students uh, that that they never actually graduate. They get degrees, but they never actually graduate. And as long as you've come to Penn State and you've uh, uh, completed, um, you can just go in the portal anytime for the rest of your life and take whatever you want. Mm -hmm. we'll, give you a bill. we'll give you a bill, but there is a certain threshold that students have to, and, and people have to exceed in order to register at, at a college in their community or to go try something online. But they know my institution. So why shouldn't I make it really easy for the 750,000 Penn State alumni to walk into that portal? They have their same email. They have their same student ID number. They just register for whatever they want. They can take it. Now, this means that these courses really need to be appropriate to be able to do building blocks. Um, but so if, if something is in sequence, however they take it, they need to have the same type of education. And it means we have to do a better job of sensing what our alumni want once they're 40 or 50 or 70 or, or, or 80. 
Um, but I think it changes what, what the university is like. You actually have an expectation. We're still here whenever you need us. And we're making it really easy for you to get what you need. I think it's great. I love that. So kind of to play off that a little bit, um, kind of kind of turning towards, you know, really that future state of higher education. Um, you know, and I'll just share, you know, just anecdotally, you know, I'm think I guess, you know, we're not going to get into yesterday's events, but I thought a lot about yesterday's events on top of every other event that our 20 to 30 somethings have been through for the last year. And I don't know if you've had any chance to spend like time or parents in the audience have spent time with their students. But there is this real sense that at least I'm picking up of the what matters, what even matters anymore. Like nothing feels like it matters. When you talk to a 20 to 30 who's trying to find their sense of self, who's trying to explore and running into a barrier that prevents them from exploring for whatever reason. Um, and, and I just think about those who are trying to apply to college or really even questioning the value of college right now. Um, and, and not because it's not the data doesn't show it and prove itself out time and time again, but just what matters anymore. And so when we think about who, who's, who our students are and what they're going through right now, as for parents in the audience who are looking at colleges, you know, for you know, what we can do in our learning environment to help students see through this moment of I feel like nothing matters. Why? Why even engage? You know. You know. On some levels, we have a responsibility in higher education because that's part of our future. And so, for some, you know, the whole thought of like having to go back to online for this semester, how many more semesters is is the world going to change forever? Is is you know makes them ill. Others, they're like, yeah, I can do this. So we've talked a lot a lot about meeting students where they are. But from what you're seeing today, like, you know, let's even just short range it five years. Like, what are the key things that we need to like deeply engage in so that we can, you know, take this generation and say, come explore, be curious, engage in this community, engage in your society to become a, 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 a citizen of the world and that it matters. And I would just love to hear your thoughts because that's really about future of higher education and relevancy. It's, it's how we deliver, yes, but it's how we maintain the desire and the curiosity and you, higher education is that source for you. I'd love just to hear your thoughts about, when you think about that for your own institutions and for your students who, who are really pondering, what well, do we I, do? I think we have multiple generations and I'm of the age where, where uh, at other times, we we had serious questions about relevancy and is, is this the right the right thing uh, the right thing for for uh, me and is it worth it to go through this when when so much else is going on in the world and and I I do think it, I do think that it is incredibly worthwhile to see the university through the eyes of different populations so. We've just done a rather extensive survey trying to understand how uh, the individuals that are applying or thinking about applying or, or voters of different ages view, view Penn State and we ask them the question what they, they want. What's fascinating is a, an older generation says that, that they, they see two things as key, jobs and the economy. And this generation that goes up, you know, in, in their 18 and, and, and their 20s, it, it is social justice and climate change. So there is no doubt that topics, that the topics that, that students feel engaged in are important ones. And I think universities and have, have to be thinking about what it is are those topics that are compelling individuals, not that you're not giving a full breadth uh, of an education. We also see, we, we're undergoing a campaign right now, and we have a theme called Impact the World, food security, energy security. These are the most popular for our donors. And so I, I think this is, a, this is a question of a relevancy that's actually quite important for universities and how it is they develop. 
I don't have much to add. I think that it, it, it certainly we should be responsive to things students care most about. And I do think curriculum offerings that deal with social justice, that deal with the history of race in this country, and that, that, that talk about climate change, the, both, the, the, both the science and the policy dimensions of climate change um, are, you know, are, are very popular today and very worthwhile. Uh, but you know, we we need to keep balance because students do need the fundamentals. They need the basic skills, and we need to train scientists. And we need we need we need to we need to educate people broadly, uh, despite those interests. There, there, there have always been um, subjects in fashion, and this is a particularly acute time for that. Um, as for the shall we say quasi depression, um, I mean psychological depression that goes with COVID, I mean, we're all suffering with this. This is like, a, this is a sad fact of the, of, the, of the year 2020 and probably 2021 as well. <clears throat> but that will end. I mean, we'll eventually end and um, students will have plenty of opportunity to go to re-engage in college as it really should be. Yeah, and I think I would add to the conversation when I when I think about you know nationally where enrollments have gone, you know since COVID in the decline of enrollment. At some level, as institutions, we're going to have to start the flywheel effect somehow, and you know perhaps it looks like what we've talked about at various points here using online and you can, you know be a Penn student, Penn State student for life. Um, how do we start? get back into it, you know, one course at a time. Um, you know, online capabilities really promote our ability to do that better and in more flexible ways. You know, five week courses, you can take three of those and still be within kind of a typical semester that will eventually get you back into a, a method, a, a desire for like, yeah, now I wanna do this again. And so I think part of what we'll need to consider in the short term is how do we create those smaller steps in so that people can commit to the realization of understanding this matters to me and it's actually exciting to me. And this is why, this is why it mattered. And I didn't think it was going to be this, this transformational for me. And so I, I do think that's gonna be a very important part of how we consider bringing students back in is to allow them to come in in smaller increments than saying, well, the full-time student gets all of these things. Well, what about the three quarter time? And what about the part time? And what about the one course at a time? And how do we meet the student, not just where they are, you know, kind of in their academic need or their modality need, but in their pace as well? And how do we invite that whole student in? So those are some of the, I guess, thoughts that I've taken away and how do we adjust going forward? You know, Claire, I'm gonna ask how we're doing on time because, you know, clearly we could go on and on, but we do wanna save some time for questions. Well, we do have um, quite a few questions from the audience. So if you don't mind, I would like to dive into those questions. The very first one circles back to something, Catherine, you started the program discussing, and that was declining enrollment over the past decade. And I think for some parents, that's not necessarily the experience they're having because of the pressures on admissions. And so I'll just go to Catherine Campbell's questions. She said, um, as parents of upcoming college students, we hear about tightening acceptance rates. So what's the anticipated effect that deferrals from COVID will have over the course of the next few years? And what are the key factors in the application process today? And how will that change uh, the formula for the next four to six years? Yeah, so I, I think this is a really institution dependent question. Um, I, I think what we're seeing is that institutions that have broad multi-state, multinational reputations and, and, and robust endowments as well, uh, and the public flagships are actually doing very well, and we're not asking ourselves uh, this question. So w our applications are double digit over what they were pre-COVID. And COVID barely was different from, from the year before for, for the fall. And I part of that, I think, is this notion that this big school, this national brand, 
a, a Yale, a Penn State, a Michigan, they're going to get you to the finish line. They have capacity to do that. And those institutions for which the pivot to online was very rough uh, because they didn't have that capability or because they lacked the resources that they might have because they've been squeezed or have a, more of a regional flavor, which means they're more a slave to the local demographics. Those are the institutions that those questions become uh, uh, much different. So I suspect as that parent was describing, they're describing very different experiences based on the types of institutions that they're looking at. So I see some institutions in my state that are down 20% and others like us that are up. Uh, and, and so it really is a different animal depending on what you're think, where you're thinking about going. In general, I think um, there's one, one, one obvious reason uh, that applications for this entering cohort for the 20, fall 2021 entering cohort are up. And that is many students got admitted last year and deferred and and they they some can go you know some of those can go back to the institution they were admitted to before but but you know so even some of those might be trying somewhere else it, it, nothing prohibits them from trying to go to a school they would prefer uh so there's a there's a surge that's really probably a short-term surge it's not a permanent one so I, there's no paradox as the questioner uh, implied really between the surge this year in selective institutions and the long-term declining demographics. Although I must say the, the, the institutions that Eric describes, the, the elite um, privates and the flagship publics I, I, are, are really, there's no, there's no, they're not in any danger of declining application pressure in the next whoever, 20 years or so. I mean, there's just, it's hard, hard to see any distress signals on the horizon there. All right, um, I see a number of variations of this next question, and I'm going to ask Andy's version of it. As he explains, the higher education experience, as you know, is a great deal more than just learning. It's about maturing, about becoming an adult. So how can ho online higher education address those aspects of the higher education experience? It, it is, in my mind, the big challenge is how do you make online asynchronous, transformative, and how do you create student engagement opportunities? So, uh, and, and I tell people, you know, residential education is, is going to be safe. It's gonna be around for a very long time just because of what was just said. I yeah. sort of say flippantly, um, you know, uh, sure, everybody can be online and uh, mom and dad can have their child uh, in, in, in their, uh, in their bedrooms, uh, eating eating meals at all times of the day, and being on their computers, and coming in at two o'clock in the in the morning, and you know, parents want their children to go somewhere and come of age. Students want that student experience that is much more than curriculum. But there are plenty of people that don't have a choice, and there are plenty of people that learn in different modes, and that's why I think we have to have this level of of flexibility. But I think we're going to get better and better at student engagement and transformative experiences online, too. Uh, be, and, and we saw that coming out of the pandemic in terms of the way we did classes. So I don't know whether in Coursera they, they have a, a, a discussion about, you know, uh, how to be transformative. Our world campus now has its own student government. And they participate in student governments, and and so you, it is changing, literally right right in front of our eyes. It's it's early, but our the degree programs on Coursera, many of them, in many of them, they're they're mostly master's degrees, but in many of them, the students form communities, and have lots of side conversations outside the context of the class, and even have even though they're scattered all over the world, have physical reunions. I attended a a gathering of. University of Illinois MBA students in London, for example, that had students from all over the, uh, all over Europe uh, a couple of years ago. Um, undergraduates much harder. I mean, the, 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 the growth experience referred to in many of these questions isn't just the classroom growth experience. It's the, it's the, it's the living together with, with 
at people in their late adolescence, early adulthood, who are forming their characters, who are, who are becoming, you know, who are really defining what kind of people they want to be and learning how to relate to different types of people, meeting people from all over the world in intimate settings that, that, that helps, helps them to shape their own, you know, their own perspective on the world. And you, I, you know, we can hope, but you can't replicate that online. I mean, you can't replicate the fullness of that, that, that 2 a.m. dormitory discussion, you know, discussing, you know, the, you know, how you're, for example, your Christian beliefs can be reconciled with your roommates of Buddhism. I mean, uh, you know, this, who, who comes from, you know, Southeast Asia or something, these things, they just aren't going to happen online. And, and we have to, I have to just recognize that for that kind of deep experience, you, you a residential, residential based undergraduate education is just irreplaceable. And that's why, that's why lots of it will survive, even if it's expensive, because it's giving you something really quite unique. Well, related to that, but slightly more specific, several people have wondered about the ability to, for hard science classes that require labs. How do you do that? Has the technology for online improved to the point where you can adequately do a lab on, online, or is that something that requires an in-person class? Well, lot, lots of lots of things can be done online, um, uh, but not, <laughs> you know, it depends, depends what, if things can be simulated, like lots of chemistry experiments can be simulated. And we've had, we have some very, very successful, you know, there's basically use a simulation model of what would happen if you took step X, Y, and Z in the experiment, you know, with some randomization, what would, what would be the outcome? And, and so that, um, you know, there are some very clever uses of, of those techniques in Coursera courses today. Um, um, it's in things like computer science courses, very easy to do everything online. Obviously in biology courses, um, much more difficult, you know, I think generally speaking, it's, it just depends on the field. Um, and in, you know, courses that require observation of human interaction, you know, anthropology field trips and things like that. I mean, you can't, you can't do that either, but there, there are, um, there are things, uh, you know, there, there, there's some things you can do online. So I, 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 I agree with, with that. And we, you know, I, I marveled at the fact that all my chemistry faculty got together and they said, okay, how are we going to design these different experiments so that they're, they're useful online and, and they were clever. They really set their minds to it. Now, if, if I'm a chemistry major, I, I'd really like that person to be in the physical lab, uh, but in, in teaching uh, introduction to chemistry and, and, and some other things, I, I think you can do an effective, I think you can do an effective job. So. I think I'll just add that this is where truly some of the best of blended education came out to shine during the pandemic. Um, you know, what, how we, we had some courses that yes, you could take a holy biology, whole biology class online through simulation. But the majority of what we did to provide the example was we said, okay, what are the max, what's the maximum capacity in a lab? And let's flip this. So that the only time students are coming in are for labs. And essentially if we've got a five credit class, you know, which is a standard biology class, we broke it up so that faculty were not getting burnt out, having to repeat labs and repeat labs and repeat labs because of the small class size requirement due to the pandemic. But that small class size requirement in the lab was such a meaningful experience for students. And that made their online portion really exciting because they knew what they were preparing for. They were preparing for this really intimate experience and hands-on and experiential connection point. And that was really exciting to see. And so I do think when we think about how students connect, you know, and how they're the, the, the dynamics of what they do and experience in a college and the undergrad level will change is that there will be more online. But my hope is, is that we continue to dial in these experiences that they do have when they do come together in these in-person environments that we see a richer experience for them. Um, so I, I was very pleased and just so excited with what the faculty were able to do and kind of that hybrid model 
and saw just saw how much our students really thrived in that environment too. This next question focuses on uh, financing of education. And there was a lot of talk in the, in the most recent general election about the financing of education and the government's role and uh, student loan forgiveness, for instance. So Doris's question is, what would be the impact if college education was provided free at public institutions? Would it be the end of private colleges and universities? And what would be the impact on the for-profit online content providers? Well, it might be the end of the public universities as well, because um, you know we have an awful lot of legislators who think you can do a, a, a lot, a lot with with uh, less and less money. And 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 quite frankly, if if it's free, it depends on where the burden of the actual cost of of delivery might be. And and so. You know, I, I really, in my mind, think the issue is the fact that the growth in this nation's population is, is largely in populations that are very low income and, uh, and many, many first, first time to college students. And the challenge there of, of financing that education is one which is probably keeping them, uh, a lot of them from going to college. So if, if you're talking about free, I, I would rather see a, a focus on making sure uh, that, that large populations of, of bright, uh, hardworking individuals have access to an education uh, because I'm afraid free would bring us down to something that's much more mechanical in order to have it uh, save, save the money in order to, to have the resources which are, um, uh, are necessary to, to really advance. Just think about the investment in universities in innovation. Where do those dollars come from? And if it's free, are you going to have, uh, as part of the public good, this nation deciding to invest in innovation. So far, you know, I would love to have been a president. I've been, this is my 12th year. I would have loved to have been a president at a time where, where state governments were giving money to universities to do great things. It hasn't happened since 2008, basically, in, in the public sector. So I'm, I'm really worried we will we will not support the level of education that we need and we will not support the level of innovation that is needed uh, if, if, we, if we claim publics will be free. Um, so that's my thought. I totally agree. Diminished state support for public, its public universities has been declining um, for now 25 years. And more since about 1993 and and it's um it, uh, you know and the, the like the percentage of costs are covered increasingly by the you know, by the by the schools themselves and and um so, so you know the subsidies have been diminishing so if you make it free to students that eliminates the tuition and the, the, the state legislature is showing no proclivity to you know cover full costs it's it would be a disaster unless the federal government paid the bill. And it's such an inefficient way to get the resources to those who need it. For many, many years, the elite privates like Yale have been supporting students on a, on a needs-based needs -based term. At Yale, 35% of the students get full financial support. They don't spend one penny. They have to they have, a, they have an earnings requirement they, for, you know, maybe, 10 hours a week of work and, and something to contribute over the summer. They can borrow that if they want, but they take no debt. They, they, they you, know, you know, Yale's rich and can afford to do this. But, but the basic principle is, why shouldn't people who can afford to pay for something that's gonna yield a 70% 70 70 increase in lifetime income, why shouldn't they pay it? I mean, it, it, education is partly a public good, but partly a private good. You, the individual gets a lot of the benefit that, of, of, of being educated. So it make, to me, it makes much more sense if, if, to, to re, reconfigure and expand massively the Pell Grant program, which has the right principle, which is 
to give the more aid the, to, to the students, the more needy they are. And we could have the education free for everybody under, I mean, we could do it at privates too, but we don't need to, privates can fend for themselves. But public ed, if you want to expand Pell Grants so students at, at, at public universities paid, you know, nothing up to a family income of, you know, $60,000 or $70,000 to median income level, you could do that. That's doable. It's a federal program. The money is, this government can support it if, if we prioritize it. I would, I would definitely go that route rather than free everybody. So we are actually out of time and I apologize to our audience members whose questions weren't addressed, but I do like to give our speakers one final moment to share their thoughts. The topic tonight was the future of higher education. And I guess I just want to maybe your over, overall feeling about the future of higher education in the United States. And um, we'll start with Dr. Levin, then Dr. Barron, and then we'll finish up with Dr. Reggio. I, I think that in America, the top universities, and, and by top, that, that's a pretty long list. Uh, it's, that also involves a lot of resourceful ones that aren't top rated, but that have know how to reach um, uh, local populations effectively. But the opportunity facing those educations through the vehicle of online education, to, to those universities through the vehicle of online education is historically unprecedented. And it, we haven't touched on many aspects of this, but just to tick them off, if, if you think about a, univ a university in 2010, its, its basic function was to educate people on campus for undergraduate masters and doctoral programs. Basically, that was what, that's what they did. And the limit, and you know, they ranged from a thousand students to a hundred thousand students. What can they do in the future? They can do all that. They can have online degree programs for X times the number of students they had before. They can, they can create individual courses and short sequences of courses for every company in America every company in the world to train their workers. They can do the same with government workforce development program. Coursera's university partners are already doing all this at a relatively small scale. We can export the best courses from America to countries where we would vastly improve the educational system. Coursera made its catalog free to, to all universities in the world during the pandemic and we had over 3,000 universities sign up, and, and we've enrolled two and a half million students in, in courses at, that were a substantial fraction of which the universities were giving credit for in lieu of, in lieu of the, uh, build their ability to mount courses for everyone during the pandemic. So um, there's enormous opportunity, I think, to, to uh, improve uh, the state of education, not only, not only in our country, but around the world. Dr. Barron? You know, I, I think we're going to have an incredibly rich university environment. You know, meeting students where they are, providing the range of opportunities to become educated that, that enable either by circumstance or, 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 or by educational proclivity to be able to get their, their degrees. And so I'm, I'm really quite excited about that future. I think the pandemic actually hastened it, pointed out a lot of the flaws and weaknesses, and, and has pointed us in, in a direction that we knew we were going. Uh, I think the greatest threat, uh, other than, than the fact that political division is now uh, resting hard on, on, on our university environment, is the fact that the population in this nation that is growing is largely urban, largely poor, large underrepresented first in family, college is getting more expensive. They are, are uh, therefore much more likely to be left out and without the technology and technological capability even to be able to take on other options. And so I, I think the greatest threat to this nation in terms of the educational part of it is actually access uh, to a high quality uh, e education because the, the opportunities are going to get richer and richer. Uh, we just gotta make sure we don't have the growing population in this country 
uh, we're, we're going to run out of wealthy kids to go to college. And, uh, and, and so that, in my mind, really becomes the issue for the future that may hold us back. Well, I guess I would, uh, I would kind of go on the other side where if access is a problem, well, we also still have graduation as a problem. More students start and don't finish than do nationwide. And this is, this is where the relevancy and the value proposition of higher education come home to roost. And I think what we've learned over, over the course of the pandemic as an accelerant, as, as, as you mentioned, Derek, is that if we have a nimbleness about us where we can disaggregate our curriculum, disaggregate a degree, change its modality, change how it's, it's reaching students, that we can create the possibility in a student's mind that the option doesn't have to be to step out, but I can stay in and pivot with my learning needs relative to my life needs. I, I think that's a tremendous opportunity for us and hopefully would be one of those, those parts of the puzzle that moves more of our nation up in, in, in an upward mobility from a socioeconomic status component um, because we become more and more stratified. Every time we have a major event, this one will do it as well. We're already seeing it. We become more stratified. And can we produce pathways, possibilities to not just have that access? I would almost argue, you know, in some ways we have a lot of access, but we also have a lot of people leaving and that diminishes the return for that student enormously. And so if we can focus our future on, on that piece and what it takes to create the possibility, I think we'll do a lot for our society as well. Thank you all very much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. To our audience at home tonight, thank you for joining us this evening. And I hope you'll visit our website to see all of our other exciting program, programs coming up this winter, a pretty diverse range. We're going from um, near-death experiences next week to Russian intervention in America later on in the month. So I hope you'll join us. Thank you all and have a great night.